uh, repeat the introduction. So this afternoon, friends, we are launching the newest um, uh, PIDS book about Philippine agriculture, particularly on revitalizing the country's irrigation system and governance. Uh, we cannot overemphasize enough the importance of this publication. The agriculture sector has been hailed by many as a saving grace of the Philippine economy amid the pandemic. Um, if you will recall, in the second and third quarter last year, while other sectors struggled, agriculture registered positive growth, but only to be derailed again in the fourth quarter due to disaster-related damages. A well-managed and cost-effective irrigation program is essential, among other factors, to make our agriculture sector more productive, competitive, and resilient. Uh, friends, to kick off our event, I would like to invite all of you to listen to the opening and welcome message of the president of PIDS, Dr. Celia Reyes. Hamsel? Thank you, Sheila. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the following. Uh, DBM Undersecretary Laura Pasqua and OIC Director Elena Regina Brillantes, Neda, Re Neda Director Nieva Natural, Department of Agriculture CAR Field Office OIC Regional Executive Director Cameron Odsi, National Irrigation Administration Regional Managers Raimundo Apil, Freddy Toquero, Constancia Banay I Jr., Jimmy Apostol, and Justado Rosales. Agricultural Credit Policy Council Director Magdalena Casuga, Philippine Rice Research Institute Executive Director John De Leon, Institute for Peace and Development in Mindanao Executive Director Akram Lati, and from the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department, we have Director General Romulo Emanuel Meral Jr., Executive Director Manuel Aquino and uh, Executive Director Novel Bangsal and um, Service Director Rose Parisawali. And from the Senate Economic Planning Office, we have Director Circes Mitafan. Um, we also have from the Philippine Crop Insurance Corporation, OIC Senior Vice President Segundo Guerrero Jr. And from Land Bank, we have Meva Ecija Lending Center Vice President Eduardo Reyes Jr. and Cagayan Lending Center Head Assistant Vice President Victor Agorto. And of course, we also have our PIDS board member, Dr. Gilberto Lianto. And from the private sector, we have with us this afternoon, Philippines Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture, Country Director Ami Melissa Chua, China Bank Senior Vice President Alexander Escucha, BAA, BAI Global LLC Chief of Party Alma Porsuncula, Chemonics International Country Director Melissa Agabin, Cargill Philippines Corporate Affairs Director Christopher Ilagan, and Exchange PH Director Lav Gregory Perez. And from the Academy, we have Cagayan State University President Urduha Alvarado, Bulacan State University Vice Chancellor for Instruction, Research, and Extension, Cecilia Geronimo, Manila Central University Research Director Venus Solar, Asian Institute of Management Program Director Federico Macaranas, Southern Luzon State University Director Melanie Cadao, University of Southeastern Philippines Director of Libraries Michelle Nugas, and Malay College Dean Jimmy Maming. And uh, from CSOs and NGOs, we have BPO Party List President Jake Pineda, Action for Economic Reforms President Jessica Cantos, Masaganang Sakahan Director Daniel Agustin, and Bayan Academy Director Carlos Sagun, and also our friends from the media. So let me also greet our guest colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS Facebook page and following the highlights of this event on the PIDS Twitter page. Good afternoon and welcome to our first webinar for the year. I'm proud to announce that this afternoon we are launching the Institute's newest book on irrigation development titled Revitalizing Philippine Irrigation, a Systems and Governance Assessment for the 21st Century. It is a compilation of various PIDS studies about the country's irrigation system, written by esteemed authors from various organizations. The printed copies will be available by next month, so for now you may read or download the e-copy of the book on our website. The Philippines, as an agricultural country, needs to have an efficient and sustainable irrigation system. A number of reforms have been implemented by the government toward this goal. As mentioned in the book, we have seen an increase in the government's appropriations for irrigation over the years, from 8 billion pesos in 2008 to over 32 billion pesos after 10 years. 
In 2018, the Free Irrigation Service Act, or FISA, was signed by the President. It exempts farmers who own eight hectares of land or less from paying irrigation service fees for water derived from national and communal irrigation systems that are managed by the National Irrigation Administration and other government agencies. Well, the passage of FISA showed the government's commitment to the lowering of the cost of production for farmers, thus relieving them from the burden of unpaid irrigation service fees. It is not a panacea for all the ills besieging the country's irrigation system. For one, a PIDS study found that while the beneficiaries of the free irrigation are poorer than average, a large majority of them are non-poor. This is just one of the challenges hampering the development of the country's irrigation system, which was discussed in the book. The book, which consists of eight chapters, evaluated the government's irrigation development program, covering both national and communal systems, as well as various program considerations, such as water resource assessment, government issues, and um, recent policy shifts. We hope that through this publication, we're able to shed light on some issues surrounding our current irrigation policy framework and assist the government in crafting reforms toward cost-effective irrigation sector development. Before I end, I'd like to thank all the authors, namely Dr. Arlene Innocencio, Dr. Roberto Clemente, Dr. Roger Luyon, Professor Guillermo Tabius III, Dr. Agnes Rolla, Engineer Tomas Paulo de Leon, Mr. Vicente Balearan Jr., Ms. Dulce Elazegui, Mr. Francis John Faderogao, Dr. Arthur Fajardo, Ms. Christine Joanna Falmino, Mr. Albert Dale Innocencio, Ms. Therese Olviga, and Mr. Julie Carl Oreta for their contributions to the book. This wouldn't have been possible if not for their efforts. I'd also like to extend my gratitude to those who endorsed the book, namely Department of Agriculture Secretary William Dar, Senator Cynthia Villar, First District of Quezon Representative Wilfredo Mark and Verga, Philippine Competition Commission Chairperson Arsenio Balisacan, Asian Development Bank Chief Economist Yasuyuki Sawada, Cornell um, University um, Professor Emeritus Randolph Barker and University of the Philippines Los Banos. Um, sorry, um, Jose Camacho Jr. You will find their messages of endorsement in the volume. Let me also congratulate the volume editor of this book, uh, our very own um, senior research fellow, Dr. Roel Briones, who put together this publication. Thank you also to the Department of Agriculture, particularly under Secretary Leo, Leo Sebastian, who's representing Secretary Dar this afternoon as our keynote speaker, and to Senator Cin Cynthia Villar, our closing speaker. We're also grateful to International Rice Research Institute Director General Dr. Jean Valley and Federation of Free Farmers National Manager Raul Montemayor for accepting our invitation to serve as discussants. I look forward to having an insightful discussion later. Thank you. Thank you very much, very much Mamsel. I hope that uh, uh, um, my audio is okay. Um, well, Quanch will not be the uh, Department of Agriculture with us. And uh, the panel has mentioned we are privileged to have Under Secretary Sebastian, who is representing Secretary. Secretary William Dar as our member. Dr. Sebastian has a long list of um, achievements and in the interest of time, uh, allow me to mention a few. Many of you remember him as Director of Phil Rice from uh, year 2000 to 2008. But aside from that, he also served as a regional program leader for the CGIAR Research Program on Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Security in Southeast Asia from 2013 to 2020. Prior to this post, he was regional director for the Asia Pacific region at Biodiversity International from 2008 to 2013. Dr. Sebastian is currently the chief of staff at the Office of the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture and a visiting fellow at Cornell University. He obtained his PhD in plant breeding and genetics. He studied at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, for his bachelor's and master's degrees. Ladies, and gentlemen, Dr. Leo Sebastian, sir. Thank you very much, Sheila. 
Lisila, I've known her for a long time and since she was still a grad, undergrad in UPLB. So, Dr. Celia Reyes, the president of PIDS. Uh, Dr. Jan Baling, the incoming director general of uh, IRI. Dr. Ruel Briones, the lead author. Mr. Raul Montemayor from the Federation of Free Farmers. Our online uh, audience this afternoon. Good afternoon to everybody. On behalf of the Secretary of Agriculture, Dr. William Dar, I would like to first read this message and then later on allow me to share also some of my views about uh, and experiences about uh, irrigation in other countries, Philippines and in other countries. This is the message of the Secretary. I am sure all of you now, all of you know by now that the agri-fisheries sector contracted by 1.2% in 2020. And I'm sure it's within the range of what many here were expecting given how last year brought in the perfect storm from the Taal eruption and the pandemic to the continuing ASF problems and the, the series of typhoids. This is a small decline given the cataclysm of 2020. But the most positive news perhaps is how the crop sector was unscratched, unscraped amid all that manage, all that managed even it to thrive by 1.5 percent. The DA will continue to boast of production of major commodities, the rice and corn subsectors, and the high value crops. The importance of high value high value crop was emphasized anew when vegetable supply had been disrupted by typhoons and thus turned to be a culprit along with meat for the 3.5% rise in December inflation. Boasting our crop sector will be an important investment as we target a 2.5% agri-fishery growth this year. A critical undertaking will be allocating bigger resources in infrastructure particularly irrigation projects and ensuring that they are built in coordination among pertinent government agencies and with science-based approach. Beyond national agencies, the agency is augmenting ties with local government units down to communities. We are taking a community-centric approach, which was a key element in the success of a banner irrigation management program we implemented in India back when I was spearheading IPSAT. <clears throat> With community-based and farmer-centric approaches, we were able to ensure all year round availability of water, higher productivity, efficiency, and enhancement of incomes. In the end, we were able to create an empowered community fueling inclusive growth. To ensure that every drop of water contributes to our goal of food security, we will aggressively harness technologies and global best practices that support a competitive agriculture while ensuring the effective management of our water resource. In communities in India, there is a widespread adoption of water harvesting technologies that collect rainwater. The volume of which can often sufficiently serve farming needs during the dry season. Water catchment projects are a good low cost solution, especially as our Bureau of Soils and Water Management has limited funds. This brings me to an important point and a very critical part of our initiatives in establishing irrigation system. We will invest in land profiling and hydrogeological profiling must also be conducted 
to identify suitable areas and aquifers for the latter for rainwater storage. Rainwater harvesting, as well as solar powered irrigation projects will help accelerate our achievements of targeted irrigated areas. In addition, it will help us cope with the expected increase of rainfall in the, in the years ahead, given the effect of climate change. As such, we must also invest in more research for development pursuit to resolve water issues. As agriculture makes up 80% of water use in the country, we have to innovate and take greater care of our water resource by, by means of climate smart technologies to ensure that we have enough food for our growing population in the next decades. On the problem of political interference, the DA will tirelessly call call on the help of the anti-red tape authority and partner with them to ensure that those who stifle irrigation projects for purposes of personal interest will be dealt with accordingly. Politics is very, is a, very much a bane to the progress of any society, but its continued intervention to today's progress is doubly heartbreaking because by now, Everyone should understand that now is the time to work hard together for a collective goal and not personal interest. This book by the Philippine Institute of Development Studies, I am confident will support the whole society, the whole of society collaboration that we at the Department of Agriculture would like to establish, especially in this unfamiliar time. Undeniably, the information it carries and the issues and recommendations it raises will shape discussions and plans we have for improving irrigation system in the country. We look forward to more PIDS initiated efforts that put the spotlight on food security as a tool for social and economic development. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And that is the message of the secretary. At this point, I would like also to share some views about uh, some of my views about irrigation. Way back in 2006, Dr. Arshi Balisakan and I, together with other authors, also came up with a book on securing rice, reducing poverty, challenges, and policy directions. At that time, we all we identified and estimate that irrigation contributes about 25% of the sources of sources of production in rice or increase in production in rice. That was significant considering its contribution. After that, I was able to go to other countries and also have experience on how have, have some observation of how they have utilized irrigation. I was in Malaysia for five years, and in Malaysia I have seen how irrigation is, is, a, is a key component in driving the productivity of agriculture diversification. So their investment in irrigation in Malaysia was not focused on rice, but it's more focused on high value crops, like their oil palm, cacao, and fruit trees. Later on, I also had the opportunity to go to Vietnam for five years. And then, and there I saw how irrigation was harnessed to make Vietnam not only a rice sufficient country, but a rice in exporting country. But later on, irrigation, because of the effect of climate change, irrigation, good irrigation management was also harnessed to help them cope up with climate change. I, I have seen and I was part of the team that helped Vietnam cope up with salinity intrusion that was affecting about 200,000 hectares of rice land in the Mekong Delta in 2016. But later on, because of the measures that uh, we did with their irrigation system, we were able to adjust their planting 
and avoid further salinity intrusion in succeeding years. We, I also observe how they utilize the irrigation system to cope up with the drought in the south in the central coast and in the coastal regions. And later on, we also help them uh, if, again manage their irrigation to cope with water scarcity in the Red, Red River Delta. So, so as you can see, irrigation is very important, not just increasing productivity, but also in coping up with climate change. Vietnam is also now moving towards crop diversification. And the, the problem that uh, the, the good irrigation in rice sometimes also gave them, a, a, often also give, gave them a problem uh, from diversify, diversifying because the irrigation facility for rice is often not suitable for crop diversification. So here I saw the project in the central coast, south central coast, that was funded by ADB, where they are basically re-engineering their system, their irrigation system, so that it will fit their crop diversification programs. So again, they are adjusting, like it, they are adjusting their irrigation system to so uh, to suit their development plans. Like Vietnam, the Philippines needs to direct. It's uh, so to redirect its irrigation system. We have a uh, rice-centric irrigation system. Our irrigation system is basically uh, inhibiting us from diversifying. Under the new program of the Department of Agriculture in the 1DA, we are now trying to harness our irrigation system so that we can also adjust our crop, our planting season. This is to help us cope with typhoons. It should have been done years ago, but and, and for reasons that uh, we still, we all understand, we have not been able to do that. But the experience that we have seen in Vietnam and in other countries, I think is helping us do this now in the, in the Philippines. We are now also introducing new technologies that can help us that are focused on crop diver diversification. So hopefully we can also start diversifying our rice, uh, rice areas. And this is very important because the crop diversification is very important because it's part of the rice tarification law. It says in the rice tarification law that we were in areas where rice will become uncompetitive, we have to start diversifying. And this requires that we have to adjust also our irrigation, the way we manage our irrigation and our irrigation system has to support crop diversification. So friends, ladies and gentlemen, we have to move away from a rice centric irrigation system to a crop diversification uh, irrigation system, supporting crop diversification. We have to do this in the Philippines as we continue to aim for more rice, those more rice locally to secure our food uh, supply. But nevertheless, we have to start realizing that we have to change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Under Secretary Sebastian. We are very grateful for the message of uh, Secretary Dar. And also, we appreciate very much the uh, the insights that you have shared with us and how we can uh, enhance our agriculture sector. Thank, thank you once again, uh, Yusek, uh, Leo Sebastian. Okay. Thank you. Friends, uh, let us now proceed to the presentation of the book's uh, summary and key messages, which will be given by uh, the volume editor. He is a senior research fellow at PIDS where he conducts policy research for the Philippine government, um, especially in the areas of um, agricultural economics, CGE modeling, and rural development. He is a board member of the consultancy group Brain Trust, incorporated a past board member of the Philippine Economic Society and a fellow of the Foundation for Economic Freedom. He has a PhD in economics from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Friends, Dr. Ro Roel Briones.
Joel, your microphone, please. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thanks, thanks Sheila. Uh, thank you, distinguished guests. Uh, thank you, Secretary Dar uh, uh, and uh, Leo uh, for, for that uh, inspiring um, speech on the topic, uh, which as at hand, it's quite a challenge for me to summarize a book. It's not a very long book. Don't want to discourage you from reading it, but still it's a book. Yeah, it's difficult to summarize this in uh, 20 minutes, but, but let me try. Next slide, please. So why, why did we write this book? Next. Well, we realized that uh, for many years, irrigation actually languished, no? especially since the 90s. So there was a big surge actually during uh, the martial law years. Uh, late 60s, 70s. You can see this in this chart. No, this is the uh, chart of public investments in irrigation. It's been rendered uh, comparable over time by uh, correcting for prices to the year 2000. So we have this surge in the 70s, and then with an economic crisis uh, that has never been seen in this country until very recently. No, but at that time that was purely due to an economic event, no, a balance of payments crisis in the early 80s. Now it's a, it's a different thing. It's a health crisis. But at that time, it's a balance of payments crisis. Our growth collapsed. And actually, for a long time, it, it languished there all the way through the 2000s. And it was uh, together with the collapse of economic growth, there was also a collapse of government spending across the board including spending on irrigation. And then there was recovery of irrigation spending right around 2005 onwards. Especially this was really propelled by the, if you can recall way back in 2008, there was a really severe uh, world food price crisis uh, affecting uh, various cereals, commodities, and in particular rice. Cost, you know, drove the whole world rice market into a panic and there was a lot of policy responses. One of the repercussions was a strong investment in rice productivity, including irrigation in the Philippines. So you can see that trend, no? We call this the resurgence, the revitalization. That, that uh, last circle, last ellipse, <laughs> ellipse that you see there, uh, that, that is the driving force behind, you know, what, was it effective? Um, were, were public funds, because this is all public funds, no? Uh, were, were they properly used? Did, did the public sector or did the taxpayer get bang for their buck for, for all of these investments? Did it help, no? Did it achieve the social objectives? Did it help farmers? Did it help uh, assure food security for consumers and so forth? Now note that uh, in, from 2008 onwards, this is now sneezing matter uh, there was a 24.4 billion appropriation from 2008 to 2012, uh, average annual. Then from 2013 to 2018, about 32.3 billion. Okay, and actually that rose a little bit, but now it is right about those levels uh, in the 2020 budget. Anyway, the, the point is very, very large. It's really a resurgent or a revitalized uh, surge of investment uh, in our irrigation program. Next. So yeah, I recounted the reasons. There was a full food price crisis. Then turns out that uh, one of the reasons why that uh, we we had uh, more bond spending on irrigation is because we didn't have money actually. So we prioritized other things. But once we started to have what we economists call fiscal space, then one of the priority measures that we wanted to spend that. Uh, that additional, those additional resources was actually uh, irrigation, uh, particularly irrigation, yeah, agricultural development in general, but within that broad subset of uh, interventions within agricultural development, irrigation was pinpointed to be a priority investment. So the, 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 the spending was driven by, if you look at the uh, current Philippine development plan, the idea was we have an irrigation area ratio of 65%. What does that mean? 
we identified the potential irrigable quote unquote area, area that could be irrigated, and the area already irrigated, the ratio of the latter to the former uh, in 2015 was 57.33 percent. The aim is by the time this uh, administration steps down by next year, that ratio will rise to 65 percent, 65.07 65 In addition, other than expanding the area under irrigation, the existing areas already being irrigated, uh, if they were found to be, well, actually, right <laughs> whether they're found to be costly or not, right now, all of those uh, irrigation service areas under the public sector so uh, being the national irrigation system and other small scale irrigation systems uh, controlled by the Philippine government. Irrigation service fee now uh, is, is, is uh, revoked, is repealed. No, it's all the, the irrigation service of those systems is now all free since uh, 2018 by virtue of Republic Act 10969. So in addition to pouring in money for investments, in expanding the irrigable, the irrigated area, uh, Philippine government has poured in more money to make operations, maintenance, management of the existing uh, irrigation systems free to farmers for availing of it, of them. No, next. Okay, so lots of resources. So probably there's a need for stock taking, no? Uh, what has been the benefit, as I've mentioned, to farmers, to the economy at large, was their bang for the buck uh, for these taxpayer uh, expenditures. Now, we covered the gamut of, uh, you know, possible topics for evaluating all of these uh, investments. No? We covered national irrigation systems, meaning irrigation systems are directly controlled by the national government through uh the main uh, uh national agency for irrigation which is the national uh, irrigation administration uh we also covered communal irrigation systems also a very sizable sector uh for the specific statistics on the areas of each you have to read book so you know? although a lot of this is already also available in the excellent psa website uh, on, on the issue uh, on, on this topic um uh, th these systems are smaller scale systems. They were actually mostly 99% assisted by uh, the, the NIA itself, but unlike the NIS, which are still managed by NIA, the CIS, the communal systems, though built by NIA, are now being managed by uh, farmer associations. So uh, nonetheless, we covered those uh, in, in this study. Uh, actually, it's not like we started this last year or even two years ago. We actually started this uh, in 2012. Actually, perhaps even earlier, no? if you look, look at even earlier studies, but uh, we, we uh, began this program in earnest around about 2012, uh, when we had uh, a, a rapid appraisal uh, study being done earlier, uh, funded by uh, Department of Budget and Management under the zero-based budgeting, if you can recall that. no. Now, the approach we took here, so there are many studies actually on irrigation, but I would like to think that uh, we took a fairly unique approach here that we looked at the, uh, uh, the, the, the whole cycle uh, of uh, irrigation uh, investment programming, starting from the planning stage, the design and planning stage, the implementation, the actual construction, building the facility, uh, operating the facility, uh, and then after operating, managing it, sustaining it, maintaining it, uh, monitoring and evaluating uh, the operations. Uh, throughout all of those cycles, we looked at issues related to the performance of the system, so various technical issues, irrigation intensity, all of these um, exotic uh, <laughs> indicators compiled by engineers. So this is a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, I'm an economist. But uh, by no means did we uh, confine the expert. Definitely, actually, the main thrust of this is actually uh, agricultural engineers. Uh, much of the evaluation here, as well as uh, you know uh, other experts, uh, uh, hydrology experts, and of course uh, 
policy research uh, uh, like myself, no? looking at performance, design, management, and even governance issues. So we paid particular um, uh, attention to governance because all the past literature said, despite all that we can say about uh, you know, the investment in engineering, the problems or flaws there, in the end, we, we have a meta sort of meta mechanism that supports to address all of this, which is the institutional and governance arrangements. But those past teachers said, medyo kinakapos pa rin, no? we, we, we still haven't been able to fix that. Why not? So we have to step back a bit and say, what, what's the issue in the governance? Why is that very mechanism supposed to troubleshoot the problems of the irrigation sector, not able to do it? So we had a deep look at governance, no? So uh, there have been various assessments, but we would like to think that this is the most recent state-of-the-art assessment. That's why we said 21st century. We took cognizance of the fact that this is the resurgent program. Uh, we realized that uh, the, all, the previous rounds of uh, irrigation were great, justified in their time, but now 21st, uh, 21st century irrigation is confronting uh, issues and problems of the 21st century. 21st century Philippine agriculture, uh, the issues mentioned by uh, Cosleo uh, a while ago, the problem, the issues of diversification, productivity, uh, widespread poverty uh, persisting in the sector, as well as you know the continuing challenges, climate change, uh, is, uh, is is also uh, treated uh, in, in in the book in the various chapters of the book. Next, please. Okay, so uh, if you read the structure of the book, we cover as as I said, no, an introductory chapter like what I'm saying, giving you now an overview, the national systems, communal systems, an in-depth look at the water resources, uh, governance issues. Uh, we have a separate chapter looking at the most recent uh, uh, policy innovation, which is the free irrigation service, uh, the service own chapter. Uh, being a policy research, as I said, no, uh, one main problem is did we get bang for the buck? That's a whole chapter in itself, chapter seven, and then putting it all together in chapter eight. So uh, I suggest obviously that you read the whole report. No? But uh, the main messages are in chapter one and eight. And the main message, you have really no time, just go to chapter eight, no? But chapter eight will be a bit, I admit, mystifying to read without having to go through chapters uh, one to seven. So I really urge you to read the whole book. <laughs> in short, next. All right, so just to give you a flavor, no? A lot of this will be presented with very shallow explanation. Unfortunately, if you want to see the in-depth analysis behind all of these statements, you have to, yeah, I'm gonna repeat this over and over. You have to read the book, okay? Uh, so I said, no, we organized the book mostly in terms of the various stages in uh, an irrigation investment program. So issues in project in, uh, identification, what issues did we see? Click please. Uh, Doc Leo already mentioned, or through the message of uh, Secretary Dar, the issue of political interference and how DA wants to address it. Uh, we found that that's uh, continuing to be an issue. Uh, now, of course, when we look at DBM documents and so on, there's a lot of justification based on potential area. But our review found that potential area may not be a reliable guide. So what is the exact area suited for irrigation systems, no? Uh, a lot of the estimates of potential area are not updated in terms of land use. So we have this estimate of potential area, but then over time, some areas have been, say, uh, converted to built up area. So in Indonesia, it's no longer a potential area, but somehow the subtraction is not done. Uh, a deeper assessment in terms of soil suitability. Now, a lot of these systems are flood, you know, uh, flood uh, irrigation. Frankly, no, the, our irrigation is not really suited for the high value crops, which don't necessarily need uh, the flooded irrigation. But if you have a flooded irrigation system, then that's 
uh, mostly rice and other water loving plants. Uh, but then if you look at the soil, so if you map it with the uh, BSWM soil suitability maps, a lot of there, there we found in our some of the systems we covered, especially in NIS, that the coverage of the area includes soils, areas of soils which are not suitable uh, for planting rice. So that's another that should have been also adjust uh, a means to adjust uh, the potential area. But we found in the actual feasibility studies project identification, this was not done. On the other hand, areas above 3% slope are excluded, at least for NIS, but there is inconsistent treatment because if you look at CIS, areas up to 8% slope are accepted as uh, for estimating potential irrigation area, uh, at least in terms in practice, no, if, if not officially. So what, 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 how, how do we square this uh, inconsistency? So um, in some areas, we may have overestimated. In some other respects, we may have underestimated the potential area. Uh, also, the identifying, you know, this is a highly technical matter, no? identifying, OK, this particular uh, area, we see this watershed, we see the, the contours, the terrain, the, the types of crops. This is suitable. It, it's not no joke being able to make that assertion in a factual and credible and uh, technica technically viable way. No? Uh, unfortunately, we found also that after a rationalization program in the late 2000s undergone by NIA, a lot of the expertise that they had uh, to be able to properly do a project identification throughout the archipelago uh, was lost, essentially. A lot of these uh, experts uh, simply retired, separated from the service. So naturally, we have to, you know, counteract these uh, findings with certain recommendations. We need to build capacity, rebuild, essentially, rebuild capacity for project identification. There has to be closer coordination with DA and local government units. Why? Because it's these local DA in its central office uh, may not have all of the information, even if you, you know, they ask help from the regional offices. They still will not have the information down to the municipal and even barangay levels. LGUs could actually advise them, no, this is suitable area, not suitable area. Uh, consider land use trends, especially if you don't have an updated land use map down to a high resolution level. And when uh, assessing potential area, not just look at the slope or uh, soil, soil suitability, we also want to look at uh, available water resources and the hard chapter uh, on uh, water resources that the chapter you saw a while ago, uh, it, it underscores that point uh, very carefully, um, especially not just now, but also taking into account potential problems, precipitation trends in the future, uh, looking forward to uh, trends in climate change. So, uh, well, the big issue in, in Philippines is not really uh, uh, long-term decline in the uh, average precipitation, but actually greater volatility. So greater extremes, highs and lows of precipitation in many areas of the country. And uh, this has to be anticipated going forward no? uh, in, in future planning for uh, irrigation areas. And also as well as uh, operations and maintenance of current systems. Next, please. So moving now to project design and appraisal. Findings, please. So actually, uh, so beyond, okay, let's, ident that, that was the previous slide, no, identifying the project. Now, uh, this seems to be a viable project. So that's kind of pre-feasibility. Now we go to the actual feasibility. Uh, if we actually put in the money, how much does it cost? Uh, what are the projected benefits? And the projected benefits, are, are they worth it? No? So uh, turns out that our review, especially if the governance found that uh, there were insufficient resources and time spent uh, for project appraisal. So uh, in some past studies, we actually saw that there was a large, after you reviewed you know, uh, what, what really transpired, the actual costs and benefits, there was a large revision of the figures. And one possible reason is because at the outset, before actually doing the project, maybe not enough time was spent and resources were spent 
in properly estimating and taking into account contingencies. Uh, we also found that there was a lack of consultative process in design. So my own person, I, I tried to join as much field work and <laughs> consultation of farmers uh, as possible in this project. And I remember that uh, I, we saw this layout in design and I asked, okay, so did we follow all of this? And then uh, one engineer said, well, the farmer said, uh, don't, don't, uh, don't operate this lateral canal. And I asked, why did the farmers object? Uh, because uh, uh, when we tried it, uh, it created flooding problems during rainy season. So they requested it to be killed. So we, we, we blocked it up and we killed it. So uh, yeah, could you not have taken that into account when you designed the project? Apparently not, no. I was told later, I will not mention which irrigation project this is. This project was designed entirely in, uh, in a certain large country, the largest economy in the world. The engineers who designed it never saw Philippines. And then they just uh, emailed the blueprints. Anyway, so uh, this is the problem no? without proper consultation uh, in terms of uh, design. So um, a lot of uh, conflicting or overlapping roles lack of coordination with other agencies. It's clear that you have to consult with DNR if you want to protect the watershed. You have to consult with local governments if you want to ensure that uh, irrigation, uh, irrigators associations uh, will be on board and will, will uh, operate it and manage it properly, especially for communal systems and on and on and on. But actually it's, it's largely, so the money is given to this agency. This agency will just do based on its own terms of reference and not really, frankly, not really care, no? Uh, the wider significance of the, this project. So our recommendations are to strictly adhere to benefit cost analysis rather than, uh, you know, relying on uh, some caprice or whim of a decision maker at the time. Now, oh, I want this project, no? My constituency demands this project. So let's push this through. Uh, if the benefit cost analysis doesn't really justify it, uh, then why push through with it? Maybe the taxpayer's money can be better put elsewhere. Implement design improvements towards greater diversification. So maybe rice is not the best use, some other use. Maybe the design shouldn't be always flooded agriculture, some other agriculture emphasizing different configuration of the system has to be considered. Uh, we may not need to flood large patches of land in you know smaller scales uh, smaller patches of land uh, may be a more uh, cost effective way of uh, um, designing the system and of course consultation with farmers okay uh, to avoid problems like like uh, i wanted uh, i mentioned a while ago as well as explore the multiple uses of water no? sometimes or actually very often especially for the larger projects it is not possible to justify a big irrigation project purely on the basis of crop agriculture alone. But uh, note that uh, properly designed uh, irrigation projects have a wide variety of uses. They can be used for drainage. They can be used for uh, hydropower, uh, for fisheries, and other benefits. If you value those, then maybe we can justify some of these projects, assuming that those other benefits are actually realized by a well-designed and well-implemented project. Next, please. Okay, so um, I'm going to move on as quickly as I can, no? because uh, uh, rather than give you all of the details, I'll just give you a flavor of what's, what's in the book, okay? When we operate the systems, we have found that a lot of these systems suffer degradation and poor performance. A big problem is siltation, because uh, the company watershed is often very much denuded. So we had an estimate of, uh, okay, after so many years, we'll need to do dredging and rehabilitation. But those so many years, if it's 20 years, actually it's 10 years. And then we had to do it, but then and it's not in our plan, right? Why was it 10 years rather than 20 years? Because the nearby forest was denuded faster than what was expected in the feasibility study. So we found that and we'll have to address that. No, uh, There are also problems, so that's the... Uh, outside the system, but even within the system, uh, despite the fact that we have organized, we have very well organized irrigation associations, but even they confront challenges in governing properly and addressing water theft, water um, uh, 
lack of compliance uh, with the directives and so on. Uh, the free irrigation system also increases the demand on NIA uh, to, to monitor uh, irrigation management transfer schemes. But uh, the budget has been mostly for additional subsidy, frankly, rather than actual uh, capacity for uh, NIA to, uh, to fund its additional role. So our recommendations are, naturally, uh, well, adopt a more holistic, we call asset management method, what that is. It's a more holistic approach towards managing uh, irrigation assets. Uh, specific uh, the description is there in the, uh, uh, the book. Continuous capacity building of NIA especially for this particular methodology. Uh, we find that the O&M funding seems to be underestimated. So there's a formula, okay, under PISA, okay, this is uh, what we need to fund uh, since we're not asked, systems will continue to deteriorate. And then, of course, uh, we flag the issue of integrating watershed management, control of uh, water resource, of management of water resources, control of erosions uh, with the actual downstream irrigation systems management. Next, please. Okay, so to conclude, this irrigation thing is no joke. It's the single largest program for agricultural development in the country, by far, dwarfing even the farm to market roads, no? Triple, double, triple, uh, the second biggest investment, which is farm to market roads. Today, we have achieved the closest we have ever to closing the gap between the potential and actual irrigated area. Yet, Despite all of the advances we've made with this revitalized resurgent irrigation program, we find that if you read the book, there's still considerable room for improvement. So I hope to stress this positive message. No, I've had a lot of possibly a lot of criticisms. These are met very well. We're not, you know, uh, trying to take down any LGUs or politicians or we're saying that we have to work together because there's still a lot, you know, like, like these people over here in this picture, no, uh, the, the, there's a big thing that they have to do. And rather than bickering with each other, they have to buckle down and work hard and then fix the problem because sila din, they're the ones who will benefit from having this problem fixed. So uh, the best effort will be to combine all of our expertise, disciplines, tools, methodologies, including stakeholder participation, so that we can maximize the benefits we can get from our irrigation development program, both now and in the long run. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruel, for gi giving us the highlights of the book. As uh, Dr. Briones mentioned, if you want the details, do get yourself a copy of the book, which you can download from the PIDS website. Uh, by next month, it will be the printed copy will be off the press, and we will announce this in, on our uh, uh, social media page. Okay, so um, we invited um, two experts to give their um, insights, to give their perspectives on perspective on the issues and recommendations discussed in the book. And um, our first discussant has uh, 27 years of professional experience in agricultural food and rural sector policies for economic and social development, primarily with international uh, development and research organizations. He has served as Deputy Director General for Research of the International Rights Research Institute, or ERI, since uh, uh, March uh, 2020, and was recently appointed Director General starting the 31st of January this year. He joined ERI in 2018 as head of the Agri-Food Policy Department. Before ERI, he worked for 18 years at the Food and Agriculture Organization in different capaci capacities. He is a PhD in Agricultural Economics from the University of Göttingen in Germany, and he holds a Master of Science degree from the University of Montpellier in France and a Diploma in Engineering from ENSA Toulouse in France. Friends, uh, Dr. Jean Ballier, sir. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you very much. Good day, everyone. First of all, I would like to uh, Thank you very much for inviting me as a discussant uh, of this very, very interesting book. Uh, I wish to express my 
most formal salutations to all of the officials and distinguished uh, guests and participants to this important event. Thank you very much once again for being here. Uh, I think this is a, a unique opportunity to discuss and reflect on a very important topic. So I really would like to congratulate the, the authors of a remarkable, on a remarkable achievement. And while I need to admit that I'm not myself a water specialist, I can tell that this book um, offers a very comprehensive coverage of irrigation related issues in the Philippines, but also expands beyond because many of the issues are actually relevant in many, many other uh, countries. It is impossible for me to comment on all the, the excellent points that uh, authors make in 15 minutes. So the, this book covers many of the most fundamental questions, including investing in infrastructure creation, uh, maintenance, governance, the water cycle, the need to better understand demand and supply issues water pricing, policies, of course, and much more. So I need to make a judgment call on which points to emphasize. As a preamble, and taking the risk of stating the, the obvious, I, I would like to recall the intimate connection between water and rice. The role of that access of, uh, to irrigation and better water management has played in achieving higher yields is considerable. Hence, issues related to water, uh, water availability and uh, water management, water economics, cannot be separated from efforts to assess the performance of rice. So, as I said, I can only cover a few points, and, 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 and uh, I have chosen four or five key, key, key points that I hope will be also discussed. So, water pricing. Water pricing is increasingly debated in developing countries. Uh, the nature of investment and policies in the water sector and pricing of water, either through taxpayer or users, shape economic incentives and determine the effectiveness as well as the sustainability of any water governance structure. The authors rightly have summarized the scenarios of who pays, and we see it here, for water and who manages in both a pre, uh, free irrigation service act and in the current FISA environment. They have also linked these categories with the national or community irrigation systems. I note that this study was conducted in 2017, the year in which FISA was implemented. Four years have elapsed since then. And while I'm certainly not suggesting that authors should write another book, uh, there is an opportunity to review these scenarios in light of the most recent development in the rice and the broader agricultural sector in the Philippines. It is changing rapidly. And I will come to that when I, when I talk about the, the, the rice tarification law. This scenario could very much help to decide which policies and institutional reforms or investment would be required to achieve a more efficient water management. Uh, it is also important to understand the long-term implications of these policies. For example, the authors find that irrigation, free irrigation is not contributing much to the overall reduction of uh, uh, production cost for rice. Indeed, free irrigation may, might bring additional challenges to sustain operations and management. The end result might be that irrigation infrastructure, infrastructure deteriorate. And this, this is certainly something that should not be overlooked. In chapter one, the authors point out that the Philippines irrigation system have mainly worked for the benefit of the rice sector. Irrigation investment largely focus on rice growing areas, it's true. One possible, possible question that comes to mind is which policies could the government envision now to improve agricultural diversification by easing, easing access to irrigation for other important and promising crops, so sugarcane, coconut, various fruits and vegetables, uh, to also offer more income opportunities for uh, smallholders. If we consider the regional perspective for a moment, the rice tarification law encourages the development of the Philippines rice roadmap. It also introduces the concept of priority provinces. Priority provinces correspond to provinces with medium uh, rice yield levels. In this context, there might be trade-offs to consider between supporting yield growth in priority provinces and harnessing other growth opportunity in low and higher yield province uh, if water could be made available. 
Next slide, please. Participatory management versus water pricing. The Philippines is one of the countries that have successfully introduced water uh, participatory water management in the water governance structure. The success of the Irrigation Association in the Philippines is uh, widely reported and recognized. I want to briefly comment on four points. It will be essential to understand how free irrigation policy aligned with principles of community and farmer participation. Two, irrigation costs are found to contribute a tiny fraction, only 2%, if I recall correctly, of the total cost of palais production. Where are the actual gains and to whom do they actually accrue? In chapter seven, authors conducted a systematic comparison of irrigation investments. They simulate counterfactual scenario based on benefit cost analysis and the agricultural market model for policy evaluation. The chapter concludes that the cost of irrigation investments are too large if compared to the expected benefits. However, a possible improvement of this benefits cost analysis would be to go beyond the incorporation of benefits from incremental rice output. The benefits from the irrigation of other crops would be considered when conducting, conducting feasibility studies. Another point, my point three, is that it seems that farmers under eight hectares are considered as an homogeneous group. Can, can that really be uh, done? I guess more disaggregation might be needed for the sake of equity and inclusiveness. How does the change in policy affect the accountability on operation and management between irrigation association and the National Irrigation Administration? The overall point I'm trying to make is that achieving community cohesion and behavior change is very challenging. The Philippines has successfully engaged the farmer community in water management, and it is crucial to maintain and improve that engagement for sustainable water management. Next slide, please. Managing water supply and demand. Most of the investment in water management have been made to improve, uh, water use, to improve water use efficiency. It is also reflected by budget appropriation uh, of the Department of Agriculture and the National Irrigation Administration, as presented in this book. However, it is equally important to understand the pathway to translate water use efficiency to water productivity. More often than not, water supply and demand are treated and assessed separately. However, these are parts of one cycle, a single cycle. An incorrect assessment of water demand can result in losses of water, social conflict, and a low return rate. There are opportunities to recompute the water demand and to consider the appropriate rate of evapotranspiration, keeping in mind that the new varieties of rice have much less evapotranspiration due to shorter duration. Moreover, more of the computation are still based on continuous, rice, uh, 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 continuous flooding of rice. They can be recalculated based on alternate wetting and drying, which is a technology that is now very well established. In chapter three, one of the recommendations is to address low irrigation efficiency through water saving technology like alternate wetting and drying. From a policy perspective, the Free Irrigation Service Act exempt most, of, uh, most members of irrigators associations in national irrigation system from paying the rice irrigation service fee. Uh, how can the recommendation regarding the use of alternate wetting and drying be aligned with the law? Can the payment for irrigation service be exempted, conditional on the adoption of alternate wetting and drying? Turning to the role of climate change, the authors mentioned in chapter four that the irrigation water supply from one reservoir to another may be reduced due to El Nino events. Authors suggest that the dry and wet cropping season schedules be revisited. Would not it be possible to achieve a higher overall system efficiency by increasing the autonomy of irrigation system managers and farmers uh, irrigation association? Aren't, we, aren't they well positioned to develop options to allocate increasing this scarce water more efficiently? Next slide, please. Water governance. The study raises an important, very, uh, 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 another very important uh, and interesting point on water governance, including the agencies involved and their interactions. The book highlights the gaps among the existing structures and recommends institutional reforms for watershed skill management. Authors suggest that a central unit be established at the watershed level 
either through National Irrigation Administration or the Department for the Environment and Natural Resources. Either way, this central unit would need to have full control of the watershed. I think this point can also be linked to the recent initiative of the Department of Agriculture to deliver one DA by improving synergies among DA agencies. The role of the DA as one of the central agencies responsible for managing water demand seems very important to me. Next slide, please. Improving synergies among uh, agencies. I wish to give you two examples of potential role of DA in this domain. The department has developed and is currently using the Philippine Rice Information System, PRISM, for monitoring rice area and the scale of the country, but also for yield estimation and to assess flooding and drought. Cutting edge technologies, including drones, are used in this platform to further improve the accuracy of the information. This platform can also be used to get the actual irrigated area in each season under various irrigation schemes. The DA might consider how their initiative on farm clustering can be linked with existing structure of water governance, especially irrigation association. I believe that the DA could play a significant role in monitoring and evaluation of water use. Next slide, please. This will be my last slide. As it is commonly said, it is hard to improve things uh, if they cannot be measured. This study highlights the lack of provision for monitoring and evalu evaluation in irrigation service model. One of the main risks is to consider that the landscapes are homogeneous in terms of water demand and use. The DA seems to be well positioned to help the National Irrigation Administration and the DNR to improve monitoring and evaluation of water demand. For example, the DA is currently working with IRI and FieldRise to develop an irrigation advisory service that can operate effectively for irrigation systems at small and large scales. The model relies on the Internet of Things technology to offer an irrigation advisory service called Automon. It allows for more efficient, efficient water management, continuous monitoring, reporting, and verification of water management practices. And it benefits from multi-stakeholder interface. These kinds of modern technology need to be embedded in the system in the overall irrigation plan to take the country towards agriculture 4.0. Last point. In relation to measurement, I wish to make, I wish to stress the importance of policy measurement. I am a strong advocate of policy monitoring for production, uh, incentives, analysis. Production incentive analysis based on relevant metrics. Part of this entails price analysis to get a better understanding about price trends and what drives them, including policy distortions. I am also include regular public expenditure analysis in, in, this, in this effort to uh, monitor policies. Public expenditure analysis is important because it helps to increase transparency on budget allocations and retrofit information for better policy decision and reforms when needed. It provides insight not only on the level of public spending at central but also at decentralized levels, but more importantly about the how is the money spent, who is getting the bulk of the support, and in what forms. The same amount of public money can be spent in many different ways with very different economic effects. I think the water sector and irrigation system efficiency would greatly benefit from a decision to establish a capacity to conduct an annual independent public expenditure analysis as part of a strong policy evaluation unit. Last, next slide, please. I wish to propose as a conclusion, a few takeaway messages for, for the discussion that will follow. Water as a resource for life is increasingly contested. The book refers to that. The future will not look like the past when it comes to water resource allocation. Agriculture is under tremendous pressure to recognize the role of and demand for water in other sectors. Rice is no exception. The perspective of this tension varies in different national and often local contexts. In many regions, it is already very clear that agriculture is getting challenged in its access to water. One key ten tension relates to the private versus public good water, as the book indicates. It is more and more perceived as a rival good. Huge amount of public money is going into irrigation with the key issue of public versus private benefits 
and the growing expectation in the general public on accountability, transparency, on externalities, and the benefits of cost to society. A case, a case, a strong case for agriculture needs to be built urgently. It needs to be supported by a compelling narrative on reinvented, uh, or reinventing the sort of social contract between agriculture and the rest of society. In other words, stakeholders in agriculture, in the rice sector in particular, need more political clout to ascertain their long-term access to water. Thank you. Thank you very much for your valuable comments, sir. And um, we look forward to seeing you again during the open forum. We hope you could stay so that if there are questions related to your presentation, uh, we'll, we'll hear more details from you. Okay, so uh, moving on, let us uh, go to our next um, discussion. And at this point, Point. Uh, let me introduce our second discussant who will give us the perspective of the farmer sector. He is the national manager of the Federation of the Farmer Cooperatives of the Philippines and has served as such since uh, 1978. He also acts as the national manager of the Federation of Free Farmers, which is a national union of small farmers, uh, which serves as the organization of the FFFC. He has acted as a representative for small farmers in various uh, local fora, particularly the public private sector dialogue platform under the uh, Department of Agriculture's Philippine Council for Agriculture and Fisheries. He has also served as an advisor to the Department of Agriculture on various issues, particularly international trade rules and rural development. He was formerly the vice president of the International Federation of Agricultural Producers and has represented small producers in various bodies at the international level. Friends, Mr. Raul Montemayor, sir. Yes, uh, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Good afternoon to, to everybody. And thank you for inviting me to this forum. Uh, and hopefully I can contribute a little bit from the farmer's perspective on the issue about irrigation. So I prepared uh, a few comments and the first one uh, links very well to what Dr. Sebastian uh, earlier said and what the other speakers were talking about. Because traditionally, the irrigation has been designed mainly to increase yield of rice, rice yields, no? by uh, improving cropping intensity and also improving productivity. But I think with what is happening now with uh, rice tarification, with climate change, and many other factors, including COVID, we have to sort of change the perspective of not only increasing our rice output, but more importantly, improving the incomes of farmers and how irrigation can play a part in that. So, so if I were to go into a specific area, I would look at the situation of farmers there, uh, see what potential crops they can raise, and then we try to look at what kind of water requirement would, would be necessary to help them place those crops. And then we design the irrigation system that is suitable to that area that will allow farmers to plant crops in a productive way and also to do it in a profitable way. So I think that should be how we should approach irrigation and not, not just from the traditional way of um, irrigating an area so that we can produce more rice uh, uh, and improve yields. No? So that, that I think is something that very few people now would disagree with. And then that brings up us to the debate of where should we put our irrigation money? Uh, here I put <clears throat> large versus small scale systems, but maybe a better uh, comparison is monocrop versus diversified farming systems. Uh, where should that money come from? Uh, uh, where should it, it be placed? And uh, the argument has been always that with uh, large national systems, um, you have lower investment cost per hectare, and there is a relatively higher cropping intensity compared to smaller systems like communal systems. Uh, 
that is probably true. Although I look at the data and the difference is not really that much. But the, the limitation of large systems, as some have said, is you're, you're stuck with palai. And that's the only thing you can produce there. And uh, I am very surprised with the findings in the study. I think it's the second to the last chapter that tried to measure the IRR, the internal rate of return, and the benefit cost ratio. That if you study the, the performance of the irrigation systems, whether large or small, and you limit the benefits to just the incremental palai production, uh, then it will come up to be a negative IRR, and the cost is more than the benefit. I hope uh, Dr. Briones can explain that further. I was very surprised with this finding, and, and the gap is very quite significant, uh, uh, which means to say it doesn't seem worth it to invest in irrigation just for palai. Uh, and uh, of course, there are many other factors, including probably the, the prices that farmers receive, et cetera. But, but the finding itself, I think, is uh, uh, like a signal to us to rethink uh, the, the way we evaluate all these investment uh, proposals. Uh, and if you go into smaller scale systems, then you have more flexibility for farmers on what crops to plant. Uh, again, it was mentioned, the larger opportunities for crop, crop diversification. And with what is happening to the price of palai now, uh, it's very volatile, and sometimes it goes very, very low, the price. Then they could shift to other crops that could have uh, better income opportunities for them. And may I add here that the management that is required for small systems is definitely much simpler and less uh, costly than if you have a large uh, national system. So um, if you want to improve farmers' incomes, maybe we have to redo our template for irrigation systems away from monocrop into uh, systems that allow for crop diversification. Um, and uh, other types of crops, of course. Okay, next. Okay, uh, operational concerns. So this has been a recurrent problem. Uh, first, poor design, uh, and because a lot of these irrigation projects are funded by either the budget or by loans, uh, there is a tendency to uh, uh, overestimate the impacts of these projects so that you get a loan approval and there is a funding, there is a contract, everybody is happy. Uh, but in the end, the irrigation system does not live up to expectations. And there is a considerable lag in the implementation of projects. For example, and we in the farmer sector have been uh, questioning NIA about this uh, for several years. In, in 2017, the harvested irrigated area was about 3.3 million hectares. In the next two years, the harvested area went down. And then in, in 2020, it went up, but very, very insignificantly. Now, but during those, those, those years, the budget for irrigation was averaging, I think, 30 billion a year. No. So our question is, where did all that money go? No. Uh, you are putting in billions of pesos in new irrigation systems and, of course, also rehabilitation. But your harvested area is going down. Of course, there is El Nino, there is uh, so many other things, but it's a worrying trend, I think, that uh, we spend so much, but we gain very little. And let me just also point out that we have this long period after martial law where the investments in irrigation went very, very low. I remember during those times, uh, it was also the fault of institutions like World Bank and ADB who did not want to provide us loans for irrigation. Uh, at, at that time, uh, agriculture had a very low appeal to world, uh, to these big funding institutions. And there was even some talk that uh, they didn't want us to invest in irrigation 
so that we will just shift to eating uh, bread and wheat and import them. I don't know if that's true, but we are now paying the price for those long years of neglect in our, in our irrigation uh, uh, investments. No? So, uh, but even with that realization, we put in more money because of the rice crisis in 2008, but the benefits that don't appear to be very significant. And then we build new systems, but our existing systems deteriorate. So one step forward, one step backward. No. Uh, so again, even as we uh, change our mindset about <clears throat> what kind of irrigation systems we need, maybe we should also start looking at different technologies uh, that may be more efficient and cost effective. <clears throat> There are some systems I saw that use pipes instead of canals to distribute water. I don't know if this is practical or cost effective, but uh, for sure it will minimize evaporation, maybe also siltation of canals, and it will simplify distribution or make it more e equitable. Uh, then there is, of course, solar irrigation, etc. And even the last, our speaker from Erie, the use of IT to monitor uh, irrigation performance. You know? So I think those are very important because we have already seen that we are not getting the, the bang for the buck in our uh, investments in irrigation, but we are spending a lot of money. So maybe it's high time that we look at new and potentially better uh, 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 techniques. Uh, and then we have to take a look at climate change. Now. And I, I, the, what goes into my mind is what happened in Northern Luzon in Cagayan last year. And why was there flooding? To some extent, because <clears throat> there were no more water sheds in Magat. So even after uh, several hours of rain, the irrigation dam gets full. And then they have to unload the water together with the silt, and then you have flooding. So you, we have to take a look at that whole uh, system from, from watershed all the way to uh, a dam, and then irrigation, and then even drainage, uh, so that we, especially when we take uh, climate change into consideration, it could be a drought. But it could also be extreme rains, rains, and that is uh, one one feature of climate change is uh, extreme weather conditions, and one of these will be uh, 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 too much rain that will cause flooding. Uh, and then uh, we have to look at more efficient water management. Uh, rice is a very thirsty crop. And uh, with climate change and the deterioration of our irrigation systems, uh, I don't think that that kind of uh, very water-dependent type of rice production will be sustainable. And then, as Leo said, uh, look into recycling and impounding, and also flood control and drainage. We have Magat. I, I know, for example, in, in Cotabato, the Ala River system, every year the barangays get flooded there. Uh, probably because of the lack of, well, again, from watershed all the way to canals. Uh, so that I think is very important. Then uh, just uh, last two points. Uh, irrigation is only one part of the intervention that we have to provide to farmers. By itself, maybe it will help, but if you neglect providing other support, it will offset whatever effect impact irrigation has. So for example, you irrigate, but farmers cannot get money to buy good seeds, or there is no proper technology or access to seeds, no proper extension, or farmers lose money because they cannot market their products. Uh, then uh, when, when the typhoon comes and destroys their crops, <clears throat> there is no effective uh, crop insurance that can allow them to bounce back. You know? So all of these have to be part of the approach to the farmer. You know? And when you design the, the, the irrigation system, 
you have to integrate it with all of these other interventions. Again, the, the objective, how will we make the farmer uh, happy with a lot of income? And we have to do it not, not, not only with irrigation, but with a host of other uh, interventions. And then finally, the importance of involvement of the farmers. I think this was mentioned earlier. Uh, in the end, it will be the farmers who will uh, make the <coughs> system uh, effective or they can also damage it if they do not uh, take care of the system. So we really have to involve them from the very start. Uh, I remember there is a irrigation NIA, NIA yun eh, uh, project in Leyte that we visited. It's a white elephant because the water level of the dam, of the water impounding, is lower than the canals. No? And the farmers were telling NIA during the design phase about that uh, uh, thing, no? but the NIA people did not listen. No? So now you have a, a, a network of canals with no water no? and a lot of wasted investment in that irrigation system. No? But uh, we also have to invest a lot in strengthening the IAs. No? Uh, um, and I think also, in a way, detaching the... They, they have a national organization, but it is sponsored by NIA. And uh, the feedback I get is sometimes even the NIA interferes in the selection of the IA officers. No, I hope that is not true. But, but when you get mother your sustenance from the NIA, as an organization, then there, there could be problems there. So we have to find a way uh, to handle that. And then maybe a last point on on the, um, the free irrigation. No? Uh, we can talk about uh, whether it's worth it or not. No? Uh, but for the farmer, it's actually a very small amount. For the government, it's about $3 billion a year. Uh, maybe you could say it's a big amount. No? But uh, from the political standpoint you know the farmers will say uh, well you you are subsidizing mrt in manila okay uh, you are subsidizing rice to uh, government employees uh, you are providing investment uh, incentives to big businesses no? and be, be, aside from all of that the share of agriculture in the budget is not commensurate to its contribution to the economy so what is three billion, and why can't you just give that to the farmer? No. I think you, we should approach it from that perspective. Let's not delve too much on the cost of a free irrigation. Three billion, uh, you're, you're you're spending thirty billion a year on new new investments that do not seem to be working. What's three billion? Ten percent? No. Uh, in fact, you should even increase the subsidy to NIA and the IAs, make it five billion so that the, the, the management of these systems could improve. No? So let me end, end at that. Uh, I hope I have contributed uh, some new things to the discussion. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Montemayor. Very important points to raise, as you can see what's happening on the ground. So uh, at this point, may I uh, invite our volume editor, Dr. Briones, um, to uh, give his uh, brief response to the comments of our discussants. Roel? Yeah, thanks, Sheila, and thank you very much for our panelists. Uh, in a while, I'll be inviting, I see a lot of the uh, volume uh, authors also here, I will be inviting them to respond to some of the points raised, no? So let me be very, very selective. No, uh, much appreciated. Actually, many very substantive and salient uh, points were raised by both panelists. Uh, for yeah, the the, the, the comments from uh, from DG uh, John, very well taken. Especially uh, updating it given new policy developments and new technological developments. Uh, as well as a lot of the, a lot of those technologies are actually being uh, uh, promoted by Erie in cooperation with uh, Department of Agriculture. But uh, indeed, no. Um, 
this this book was many years in the making. So at any time that it will be released, it will be kind of behind in some areas. Hopefully, still very, <laughs> still still very uh, uh, insightful in terms of the things that it has observed no? uh, while it was being written. Uh, contributions from uh, Raul, uh, the, the interventions of Raul are, are very well taken. I think he had a question about the, the chapter specifically authored by me uh, on benefit cost analysis. But actually, as he was discussing, actually the answers to his question were already there. No? Uh, the, the benefit cost analysis was based on, so what are the benefits, right? Uh, the incremental yield and then the incremental uh, irrigation uh, cropping intensity. As you know that the incremental cropping intensity was somewhat very small. We're spending many billions, but when we look at rain-fed areas versus uh, irrigated areas, the cropping intensity doesn't seem to be much different. I was quite surprised, no? The average cropping intensity, even in rain-fed areas, is way above one. It's 1.2 or something. And then it's 1.6 or 1.5 in irrigated areas. So right then and there, no, you expect one for uh, uh, rain-fed areas and two for irrigated areas, but no, they're they're much closer than that. And that actually uh, restricts the amount of benefits that you can value. Then the well, the yields are uh, quite substantially different. But if you factor them together uh, along with the costs, then that's how you explain the negative IRRs. When I shared this with Nia, they actually did not. Uh, what they said was in justifying, especially the big irrigation uh, projects, they put in all of the other benefits, the hydroelectric, the fisheries, uh, the water drainage, uh, uh, disaster management benefits. And that's how they bring up the uh, estimates of EIRR and get it hurdled through uh, the, the, the ICC, no Investment Coordination Committee. Uh, at this point, maybe I can invite the rest of the uh, chapter authors to please comment uh, on the uh, discussions. Uh, very, very good points. Thank you. Uh, anyone from the authors? Yes, are, uh, Hi, Dr. Inusiancio, go ahead. Hi, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, but first, I would like to thank PIDS, PIDS for uh, this opportunity uh, to, um, you know, put together uh, this uh, different chapters and have this book uh, published. And thanks also to the leadership of Ruel, uh, who had been really very patient with everybody. Uh, I, I think, you know, the points raised by the discussants and also the points raised at the beginning by Leo were really all uh, relevant. Uh, of course, there are nuances, uh, issues that are specific, uh, uh, and, you know, that which are relevant in other countries, but not quite for the Philippines. But let me just point out two or three things, no? Uh, first is that, well, I think the diversification uh, issue, um, you know, Leo was saying we should uh, in fact, really push for um, uh, non-rise or going to non-rise uh, because if we really want to help our farmers in, increase their incomes, uh, yeah, I think the potential should be bigger in non-rise crops. However, um, as Roel was saying, you know, we have been talking, he, he had been writing about this since the late 80s or mid, was that late or mid 80s? Um, but I suppose that, uh, you know, there is still so much to be done in terms of really understanding uh, why, you know, it's not uh, easy to, to convince farmers to, to shift to other crops. No, because it's not just providing, NIA is in fact quite willing and open to provide irrigation to non-rice. Uh, if you look at the profile, uh, the historical profile of the NIA irrigation um, uh, system, or projects or irrigated areas, uh, it's only, I mean, you know, non-rise is just around 4% of total irrigated areas. It's really very small. And, you know, <laughs> how uh, NIA has been around since 1974, and you still just have 4% of total, 4 to 6% of total irrigated 
uh, areas uh, for non-rice, no? and that is largely banana, uh, banana in Mindanao, and probably some, a few um, uh, vegetables in uh, in Region 3, yeah, and maybe yeah, a little of sugar cane, but it's largely actually banana. Um, so, but the hands of Mia also, I think I would say would be tied. I mean, we cannot force farmers to shift to to, to non-rice, no? If historically, they only know how to grow rice. You cannot just, you cannot just tell them, okay, here is an irrigate. Uh, we are providing water shift to non-rice, no? I suppose that, um, you know, this part would really require a better understanding, and I have seen uh, uh, or, or read about uh, DA's initiative now, which is to go for um, resilient supply uh, chain uh, approach. I think that may be the way to really properly understand. Obviously, it's not just irrigation, which is the problem. So earlier, also, the other discussion was talking of seeds and the other and other um, uh, relevant uh, support no? that would be required so farmers would have the confidence to really pursue non-rice uh, crops and and perhaps really you know succeed in improving their um, their their um, their situation no? <laughs> uh, so but the second uh, the second point is um, on um, the, the the choice of projects if you look at the investment profile of NIA, um, historically it had been uh, on national irrigation systems and, and then somehow over time uh, the share of communal irrigation systems also increased. No? Um, and uh, well, there are benefits to the national, to having NIS versus CIS. Uh, if you have NIS, of course they are, um, uh, how do you say that? Uh, probably better in terms of uh, uh, water uh, if you can if you note from the um, cropping intensities of nis and cis uh, from the data of mia of course the the nis uh, systems are much higher cropping intensities than cis no cis is just what 1.2 1.4 at best so uh, but for nis i mean it's really much higher than that uh, so, well, um, there are there is more flexibility in CIS, but historically they had also been uh, largely dependent, no, dependent from uh, from their congressman uh, support from congressmen from the local government, uh, despite the the what is this uh, the the look, what is this? the LGC now which was supposed to devolve. Uh, the, the CIS to local government. If you look at the, the results of the survey, there is just a handful of LGUs which are really, um, you know, um, addressing or, or partnering with farmers and uh, supporting uh, irrigation no, for uh, especially the, uh, the CIS. Um, the other is, um, sorry, I think the, the greater or the, I would say, um, um, the bigger issue is really the, the spending on the OMM. So now, of course, you have the FISA, so uh, it's currently, what, $3 billion per year. Uh, so, and even that $3 billion is not really enough. Um, but if you look at the systems, uh, probably it's not uh, off to say that they, you know, it's, you still see the systematic degradation uh, or uh, deterioration uh, so that the systems really uh, are not delivering um, you know, the efficiency they are supposed to deliver when they were first completed. Um, so I suppose that that, that is something which we has to, to look at. Uh, I was in fact happy with the slide of um, uh, the IRI director, um, uh, Dr. Balle, uh because, uh, you know, it's difficult to manage something which you do not measure. So, and if you look at the data of NIA, that is really one of the problems. No? There is no uh, a GIS uh, base, uh, data, a GIS database system which is um, um, available for all the systems that, needs, that NIA is managing, which is surprising because you would have thought that you know, that should be the first place to start. No? Uh, so I, I suppose that you know, a really very good understanding of the, the woes in uh, O&M 
and the resources that uh, you know needed to uh, to to maintain the uh, system. So I have many more, but I would like to give the floor to the other authors. Thank you. Okay. Would the other authors um, have anything to add? Uh, because uh, if there is none at this point, we can. Okay, Dr. Rolla. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Go ahead, Professor Rolla. Yes, we can yes. hear you. So yeah. Good afternoon, and again, congratulations to PIDS for finally publishing this book. But most of all, congratulations to Rowell. I mean, Rowell was the shepherd of this book. He was thinking about this book even before we started doing our data collection. Um, I think Arlene has already um, stated a lot of things, covered a lot of topics. Um, let me just uh, cover the two things that I would like to share with you. And the first is on the FISA. Uh, when we went to the field, that was true, I was in 2017, the first time and the FISA was very new. So farmers didn't even know how to react to the question that we were asking them. And uh, some of the uh, CIS, for instance, especially CIS, still collected uh, uh, irrigation fees because uh, they felt that, well, number one, the, the support was not there yet, and secondly, the support was not coming uh, on time for their needs. So during those times, uh, there was a um, I mean, like our data would show also that um, the farmers has not appreciated the visa for that matter. But I think for the future, what's going to be the next step is to really understand and study the implications of the visa. Um, for instance, one of the things that we need to understand is whether the subsidy that we have right now is really uh, appropriate level. Uh, is it a billion? Is it five billion? And what is it for? Is it for just operations and maintenance? Is it for capacity building? So all of these things, I think, need to be uh, looked at in order for us to be sustainable in terms of our operations and maintenance. Um, the second is the um, comment from uh, John Bailey of Erie, uh, where he was saying that um, agriculture should uh, build a case so that a water will be given to the sector. Indeed, that is true, because um, as we move forward, uh, there is a growing conflict or competition about water. So water permits at this time, uh, NIA holds a lot of the water permits, but in the future, there's going to be a lot of demand from the industry, from domestic, uh, from households, etc. So indeed, we need to think about again, what kinds of policy support are we going to have so that we make uh, water in agriculture still attractive and still pursue our food security goals. So I guess those are two of the things that I'd like to share, Sheila. Thank you. And thank you as well, uh, Professor Rolla. Um, does the other, uh, do the other authors have anything to add? Uh, okay, because if not, perhaps we can already uh, proceed to the open forum as uh, our chat box now team with questions and al along the way uh, the other authors can, uh, can can share their uh, insights or uh, their responses to these questions okay so friends uh, we now I know we now open the floor for questions but uh, before that um, I'd like to tell you that um, we, we won't have a, a poll today. However, we will be drawing uh, two names from um, our WebEx participants, and those uh, and they will receive a free copy each of the printed irrigation book as soon as uh, the, the book is off the press, and we will announce the winners uh, before we conclude the webinar. So now, let's now have a, um, a quick um, uh, Q and A, and for our first question, we have um, we received a, a question from uh, the former president of PIDS, uh, Dr. Gilbert Yanto, and uh, this question is directed to the to the authors. Um, he says that uh, um, 
in the presentation of Rowell Irrigation Services are free um, and that government will provide for operations and maintenance costs. Um, and uh, Rowell mentioned that this is going to be a huge expenditure. Um, he is asking Rowell if you are hinting to bring back irrigation fees to be paid by the farmers and why. Uh, perhaps you can clarify uh, your point or uh, what you discussed earlier. And what will be the advantage or disadvantage of doing this? Rowell? Yeah, uh, thanks, Sheila, and thanks, Gilbert, although he said that he has to leave already, but anyway. Yes. Uh, uh, well, it's a law, okay? So we, we, I'm not saying that we should overturn a law, but the study uh, had some findings about the implications of implementing the law, as we have, no? Uh, it's a huge expenditure, and I think uh, I scrolled ahead in uh, Marcel uh, Solatre of uh, Senate also had a similar point, no? that uh, a lot of the expenditure is actually going to the non-poor, also pointed out uh, in the chapter. But this yes. is almost inevitable, right? Once the law, once you have a policy like this, you have a very high cut of eight hectares, and then everybody farming eight hectares and below, uh, they get uh, free irrigation. That's a lot of types of farmers, right? Uh, including the smallest farmers, uh, relatively large farmers, six, seven hectares with tractors and so on. Uh, they're going to get everything free in terms of irrigation. So it's it's not this this result is not unexpected. Perhaps what's unexpected is how big they are. No, it turns out that uh, rice farming has worked for a lot of rice farmers. It's pulled them out of poverty. A lot of them are already non-poor, right? So. For the sake of helping the certain percent who are poor, we're pouring in a lot of huge expenditure, as mentioned, uh, for the non-poor. That's why the SAFE chapter says, maybe uh, we can look at more targeted um, uh, types of policies. What are targeted? Very precisely, tar well, better than most other programs is something like a conditional cash transfer, because it's a really means-tested uh, provision of subsidy. You check if they have uh, correlates or proxies or markers of poverty. That's what you give. That's whom you give the benefit. If they don't meet these uh, markers, then sorry, uh, you, you, you're not qualified. No, we, you're saving our money for somebody else. Free irrigation doesn't have this, plainly. I have to put it bluntly. So I'm posing it, posing, posing it to our policymakers that that's the implication of the policy. Um, personally, of course, I have my own stand, no? But uh, as, as a researcher in a government institution, we're just pointing out the consequences of these policies. Thank you, Ruel. Uh, let me jump to um, Shenmo. Arlene, would you like to add something? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. No free irrigation, no free irrigation. No free irrigation. No. not to all farmers. Uh, okay, uh, Senator? Senator yes, yes yeah. ma'am, uh, go ahead po. I just want to explain that free irrigation is only limited to farmers owning less than eight hectares. So it's not open to all farmers. And at the same time, uh, we are passing a law that the excess tariff beyond 10 billion of the RTL will be given to farmers in terms of uh, uh, financial assistance. That's uh, for this year, it's 5 billion to uh, farmers owning less than one hectare, one hectare and below. Okay, that's it. I just want to to clarify things so you wouldn't you would understand that it's not for all farmers. It's just for the small farmers. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, we are very glad that you can join us in the open forum, ma'am. We'll hear more from uh, Senator Villar later as he will be as she will. Uh, be um, closing formally closing this this event. Okay, uh, let me jump. To... Okay, sir. Uh, I just, Dr. Tabios, go yeah, ahead, sir. I just want to add quickly because uh, of this free irrigation. If you think about it, maybe if you think that we have 1.8 million hectares that's irrigated by rice, and the subsidy or the 
farmers pay 2,000 pesos per hectare per cropping season. That's almost 4 billion or maybe 3.6 billion per cropping season. Now, I think way back uh, five years ago, I, was, I had some discussions with uh, Dr. Tina David, who has also been acknowledged in this book, who has you know, contributed in, in several ways. That to begin with, we already subsidize our farmers. But on the other hand, maybe half of it will raise subsidize. But on the other hand, is 3.6 billion can be translated into some, you know, opportunity cost somewhere else. Even if we spend 3 billion per crop is or even 6 billion a year. So maybe Senator Villar mentioned about 10 billion. So definitely the 7 billion a year subsidy in that case, perhaps it's, it's also worth it because anyway, we already subsidize them. Why not subsidize them fully rather than just partially? So that's, I just want to point those numbers. Thank you. Senator, just, go ahead. Yeah. Now. I just want to clarify that the collection for this year on the rice tarification law, the tariff on rice is around 15 billion. So 10 billion will go to the Rice Competitiveness Enhancement Fund. And we are passing a law that the excess will be given as financial subsidy to form to farmers owning one hectare and below. Okay, that's it. So instead of making programs, we deem it right that we just give the money to the small farmers. So it will go directly to them as what you are saying. Uh, so th this is a combination. Uh, we are not limiting to all financial assistance. We're giving some financial assistance, but, but we are giving also technology uh, like mechanization and seeds and training and loans. So it's a combination of many. It cannot be one only. So uh, we're, we're really uh, thinking about it, what will be good for the small farmers. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Vilgar. We are uh, very glad that you are here to clarify issues regarding the FISA being the principal author of the law. Okay, um, since we are uh, now um, entertaining questions on the uh, on the free irrigation, uh, let me jump to a question from Melba Tutor. And he, she said, on the issue of free irrigation, early on it created serious problems for um, irrigate, irrigation associations that were relying on irrigation service fees for their operations such as organizational expenses and the cost of maintaining their irrigated areas. How was this addressed by NIA and how was the ONM support completed and disbursed? Uh, we don't have any panelists from NIA, but perhaps um, authors could answer this based on the data that they gathered from the field. Uh, yeah. Well, yes, so go ahead. Yeah, th there are two two regimes. Uh, one is for national systems. Mm -hmm. In national systems, NIA was collecting uh, that mm -hmm. irrigation service fee. In communal systems, it was the uh, IAs, the irrigators associations themselves, that was collecting that. No, for the first type, the national systems, that fee collected by NIA was removed totally. So NIA mm -hmm. is now the one. Uh, paying for the ONM, but it requires a contract. Uh, so now uh, IAs enter a contract, an irrigated uh, irrigate, uh, IMT contract with NIA uh, in return for be availing of this um, ONM funding uh, directly paid mm -hmm. for by government. And mm -hmm. uh, if they meet certain uh, indicators, then they will be the ones administering the fund. But if they cannot meet these indicators, Nia has uh, mentioned that uh, they will be the ones taking over the direct management operations and maintenance uh, of these okay. systems. I have no update on the status of this. I was hoping that somebody from Nia could, could update us. And maybe uh, somebody might say something later. For the communal systems, it's a straight out subsidy and the IAs continue their management. So it's up to them now to use wisely the money being 
uh, paid by NIA uh, as subsidy for the uh, ONM. That said, they are not precluded from collecting. So we, we hope, hope that uh, in late, later update, we can actually find out how many uh, far, um, IAs continue to collect some version, they may not call it ISF, but some version of membership fee or membership due that will still be used na panustos, no? To because one of the findings of our studies, uh, a lot of the farmers are saying that the amount being provided doesn't seem to be enough uh, to really cover the total mm -hmm. cost uh, of the ONM, whether for national or for communal systems. Okay, and I think you mentioned in the book that um, uh, it should be performance based. I ah, think that's one. Yeah, of, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. The bank. So they have to meet certain indicators. To be fair. Yeah. Yeah, they have to meet certain indicators. Thank you very much, Ruel. Um, that. Let's, let's now go to yes. Yes. Uh, yes. I want to. Go ahead yeah. Now. Yeah. One of the findings that I saw in Ia, I don't know if uh, your the book that authors of this book noticed that, that if you analyze their expenses, in the beginning, uh, they have 50% for repair and maintenance and 50% for new projects. So I asked uh, DBM, uh, because I came from the private sector, if you allow 10% for repair and maintenance, that is enough. But in this uh, uh, irrigation systems, they allocate 50% for repair and maintenance. So I thought that that's abnormal. And I asked DBM, uh, what do you think should be the right amount for repairs and maintenance? And they said it should be something like 20%. So from then on, I asked Nia to make the adjustment that they have to bring down their repair and maintenance and bring up their new irrigation budget new irrigation project budget. I don't know if uh, PIDS noticed this. So from then on, we're trying every year to increase their new irrigation budget and bringing down their maintenance budget because I find 50% too big for maintenance. So I don't think uh, you can complain that they are not maintaining it well because they're spending 50% of their, their budget for maintenance. So it's only now that we are adjusting, and I've asked them that at least this year they did 35% for maintenance and 65% for new irrigation. That's why siguro ko konti yung na produce nilang new irrigation facilities. I hope you notice this when you analyze their expenses and maybe make a comment on this. Thank you. Thank you, well, Senator. Yeah, I think uh, Arlene... Arlene has been poring over these figures for many years. Maybe may I invite Arlene to, to reply, please? Um, thank you for the comments, ma'am. Um, actually, I think uh, in terms, uh, this is also one of the things that, in fact, we had been advo advocating for. Uh, the the um, distribution of investment in terms of new irrigation, uh, new areas versus rehabilitation rehab projects um, and others now yung mga small uh, mga ano ito, small pumps and and uh, well, uh, watershed uh, management projects which actually would account for a very small uh, percentage of total allocation of niya well i think uh isa ito na ano uh, isa na uh, sorry to say parang um, 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 Oh, how should I say? A misunderstanding of the rehabilitation project pump because uh, if you look at the the annual if you look at the annual damage, no, I have looked at the numbers for annual damage to the systems of NIA would be around on average uh, two to three billion. So I'm not sure that in fact there is that uh, there is a budget that is uh, allocated to to respond to that, and that is every year. So every year, if systems, uh, the, the, uh, if systems are degraded or systems cannot perform at pass as they are supposed to perform, 
because in fact half of the canal or the the part of the uh, dam has been damaged and only one main canal and water can only flow to to the right side of the main canal and cannot flow to the left side of the main canal and uh and so you know systems used to irrigate uh say uh, 10,000 hectares it can probably just irrigate um uh, le much less than 10,000 uh, hectares. No, sabi natin maybe maybe half or or even at 8,000 uh, hectares. So investing actually in rehabilitation restoration projects would make sense because the 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 yeah. systems are yeah. are already there, but you just need to uh, you know repair parts like maybe. Uh, uh, repair, uh, uh, build the canals that were not built at the beginning in, when the project was initiated or add other uh, features so that the system would actually perform better. So indeed, this, this uh, rehabilitation restoration projects will not produce new irrigated areas, but they would actually improve very much the performance of the old because of those old which are which would comprise the majority of the systems of NIA they were built what from uh, uh, since 1960s 30 40 years ago and they are very much uh, highly silted already so they could not perform as as they were supposed to perform so uh, if we don't invest in that and we keep on investing in new we would actually benefit more uh, in uh, investing in restoration and rehabilitation. I've looked at the, I've compared the 2010 and 2017 figures of NIA. They have actually uh, succeeded in improving a little bit because in 2010, only 72% of the irrigated service area were operational. And, I'm not uh, against, uh, excuse me, I'm not against repair, but when you spend your 36 billion budget 50% for repair, that is how much? Uh, 36, 18 billion for repair. You said it's 3 billion a year, but they're spending 50% of their budget for repair. I'm not against, I told, uh, when I asked DBN, how much do you spend for repair? 20%, so if your budget is 30 billion, 20% is 6 billion. So is that not enough? Um, you're yes, talking of three billion. When I uh, when I reach Nia, they're spending fifty percent. So if their budget then was thirty six billion, they're spending eighteen billion for repair. So do you think that's normal? Because in a private company, you don't spend fifty percent for repair. Otherwise, your your company will go bankrupt. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm just, uh, I'm just I, I, I came from the private sector and repair and maintenance in private sector is 10%. So I asked DBM, what do you think is the reasonable amount for repair for NIA? And they said 20%. So we're trying to bring it down to 20% because the starting point is 50%. Uh, Mar do you agree that you don't spend 50% of your budget for repair? Uh, yes, I agree with you. But if you consider the fact that historically they had not actually been uh, successful, what do you think is happening? Okay. Because when you when you spend it for repair, you don't find anything new. You can say that you repair this, but did you find the repair? But if you uh, uh, if you construct new, you have to show me what is new. Perhaps yes, we yes. can so hear I, the feedback. Uh, you're, you're right, Pam. <laughs> okay, perhaps we can hear the feedback of Nia. We have um, a participant uh, with us today uh, uh, who may want to share um, his feedback, her feedback on behalf of Nia. Ms. Uh, Delcy uh, Revillame, who's acting department manager, operations department. Of okay, lang mag repair, but not half of your budget for it. Ms. Uh, Revilla Mayor, would you like to say something? Hello, ma'am. Ma'am? Ms. Delphi? Hi, Ms. Delphi. Magandang. Hello, ma'am. Mr. Mr. Okay. 
perhaps we can go back to uh, hello, uh, Mr. Re uh, Miss Abelti Revilla Mayor. Would you like to say something on behalf of uh, hello? Uh, this is Jerome Sias, Ma'am Delti Revilla Mayor is in another meeting. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes, go ahead, sir. Uh, I, I will uh, get back to you, ma'am. Uh, I will just uh, ask uh, her uh, statement for that. Okay, thank you. I can see uh, someone raising his hand. Can I make a quick comment? Uh, yes, okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, maybe a little bit about the... I think there was an issue before when you talk about whether you're the budget for repair, maybe rehabilitation or restoration. Those are two kind of, uh, what is that? Uh, it's a little bit confusing. The other point is that uh, what I'd like to say is that when we look at those irrigation systems, national irrigation systems, uh, uh, eight years ago, again with me and Dr. Tina David, so many of those large irrigation systems, when they budgeted the, the project, maybe for so much area, service, uh, irrigation service area, but only maybe 40 to 60% are realized. So then you already build the budget, I mean the project, and then you have cost overruns. So how do you now put it to the 100% target to begin with. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's where the, how they then define in some sense, oh, we're gonna restore or rehab. But to begin with, it was not built. I mean, let's give an example. The Pampanga Delta Irrigation System designed for 11,000 hectares, but only 4,000 up to 6,000 have been realized in the past 10 years, I mean, 20 years, built in 2002. Ambry, same thing, built it for 31,000, but it was the only realized historically up to maybe 27,000, 28,000 hectares. But now it's uh, running between 17,000 hectares to, to uh, 24,000 hectares, depending on what season, dry season. Same thing with uh, the UPRIS, 130,000, I think, hectares, but only 100,000. The same thing with the uh, this uh, Balog Balog, I mean, Balog Balog is a very good example. Yeah, but yeah, that is, uh, so I, how, did the, how did that happen? Maybe that's something that we can ask in here. And maybe that's where you have cost overruns. So if you're trying to restore, maybe you re you're really trying to supplement or rebuild or build portions of that. That's why the the budget, you know. I just want to clarify that maybe that's oh, an issue. I, I looked at, uh, may, may I answer? I look at the Balog Balog case. It's a multi-year project. They do it by phase year by year. That's not repair. That is building uh, over the years. So they have a budget for this year. They build this, then they continue next year. It's a series of small dams. Five small dams, I think. Uh -oh. So it's not repair. It's a multi-year project. Yes. So that is new project. That is not repair. That is not classified as repair. That is classified as continuing project, new project. They build it uh, year by year. In fact, my complaint is uh, it was uh, the request of the president of the Philippines during that time, President uh, Aquino, and uh, because it's in Tarlac, isn't it? Balog, balog. Uh, I was saying, how come you did not finish this when the the beneficiary is the province of the president of the Philippines? I was so surprised that they were not able to finish it during that time. They're still building it face by face. Uh, it's not repair. It's building yeah. it slowly, face by face. So it's a multi-year project. It's not repair. When I talk of repair, it's for repairing the existing ones. It's not for building multi-year projects. And I asked the DBM, what is the reasonable repair? And they said it's 20%. That's why I'm trying to force them uh, to reach at least 25% uh, man lang, wag na 20%. 
Kasi parang nadidelay yung ibang project because nauubo sa repair. Iba naman yung repair, iba naman yung multi-year project. That they finish it slowly year by year. Kasi miski sa public works, yung mga kalye, may multi-year project. They cannot finish it in one year because uh, they don't have the budget, but they can do it slowly year by year. And they are considered new projects. They are not repair. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Villar, we hope to hear from uh, Nia once they are ready. <laughs> you should have included them because oh, I'm so surprised they are not here. <laughs> this is about them. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Dr. Innocencio, I think you would like to show us something. Uh, yes, yes. Um, can, can Gwen show that graph? Yes. Uh, yeah. So yun lang graph na yan. So, um, yeah. pwede palakihan lang, Gwen, please. Maliit masyado to see. And you make that bigger? Yeah. Uh, so this one shows the, the, the um, area, the irrigated area areas, uh, total irrigated areas ng 2010 and 2017. So, uh, in 2010, the operational uh, firmed up uh, service area was just 72% of total. And But in 2017, NIA actually succeeded in increasing the, ir the, the total functional operational um, uh, irrigated area no from 72 percent of 1.6 million hectares to 76 percent of 1.8 uh 1.856 million hectares so siguro at that time when they were uh they had that um they were allowed to invest in in higher um allocation for uh, rehabilitation and restoration so they were able to repair this as uh, mentioned by glenn uh, yung Pampanga Delta, kung, you know, if, if it was supposed to service 11,000 hectares, but over time, uh, you know, it only succeeded in irrigating, um, what, 5,000, 5,000, 7,000, so much, much less than uh, the design, uh, the design total. So, apart, uh, um, my understanding is that the restoration and rehabilitation uh, investments are supposed to, um, you know, uh, to address this, no, uh, to to um, to meet that uh, the design uh, target uh, irrigated area. So even without in, uh, doing new irrigation uh, projects, uh, restoring and uh, uh, rehabilitating can in fact already increase the operational. Um, operational uh, or operational irrigated areas by so much. Um, so from 2010 to 2017, that's 4% of 1.8 uh, million hectares. That's a big increase. So may effect pa rin yun dun sa productivity ng, uh, ng um, farmers. So siguro dito napunta yung mga rehabilitation kasi kung every year hindi sila nabibigyan ng 2 to 3 mil billion for the rehabilitation, nagpa-pile up yung, yung uh, repairs na yon Nagpa-pile up na nagpa-pile up. So even now, they still have 16% of their service area which uh, are, would be considered non-operational. Mm -hmm. So farmers are not benefiting from that 16%. Thank you, Arlene. Um, actually, we there is a comment here from Delcy Rivellami of Mia. Um, Delcy, are you ready to give your comment, or should I just read it? Hello, Delcy. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, I think they're not yet ready, but so perhaps we can uh, we can uh, uh, go back to them. Um, there is, let's uh, uh, entertain another um, question. Um, 
Okay. There is a question here regarding the uh, administration of Mia because right now uh, it's it's not under the uh, uh, the Department of Agriculture. Um, yes. So, in your opinion, would it be better if this is under the DA or should should it be or you know just the status quo? We follow the status quo of having it under the supervision of the office of the president. Perhaps we can um, get the inside of one of our um, guests. Uh, Dr. Sebastian, would you like to comment on this, sir? Being part of the, the DA? Dr. Sebastian? Okay, perhaps he stepped out. Uh, but, Ruel, um, I think you're raising your hand. Any comments? No, I will. I maybe we can take it up with actually it's been uh transferred back to da uh maybe we can take this together with another governance question okay, okay? i think uh, the, the next one is uh, from mr yu is that the next one yes there is a question here from uh mr yu who is actually a spokesperson of nia region Five and he has uh, some concerns about uh, the, the full devolution of the communal irrigation project to the LGUs starting and in 2022. Yes, because I'd of like the to put, Yes. Yeah, sorry, I'd like to yes. put Agnes on the spot for this yes. question. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, since this uh, question is not visible to our Facebook viewers, allow me to read it. Oh, okay, okay. For okay. the benefit of our uh, social. Uh, media viewers so uh mr this is from mr uh, eduardo Yu, spokesperson of nia region 5 so he said government investment on irrigation is, is expected to go back to the 1990s level given the full devolution of communal irrigation projects to lgu starting 2022 because of the supreme court decision in the in the mandanas case this will substantially slow down irrigation development as shown by experience when the local government code was implemented in 1991. For the country to fully develop its irrigation potential, the national government should not devolve communal, ir communal irrigation systems to LGUs as most LGUs have other priorities because of limited internal revenue allotment, including political consideration. Irrigation systems have limited number of beneficiaries who are voters. LGUs would rather spend on barangay roads than irrigation system because many voters will benefit from it compared to the limited number of beneficiaries voters of a communal irrigation system. So, Ruel, uh, you would like um, Professor Rolla to comment on this? Professor Rolla? Okay. Yes, yes, I'm here. Yes, so for the first question regarding the uh, positioning of the uh, uh, to the of the president, I of course we did no unang panahon. Uh, we did not know even the rationale for that. But um, at this time, um, again, I wonder whether it's for me as long as it gets its job done, and doing the job of Mia means really working with and collaborating with other agencies such as the DNR, such as the DILG, and even the DAR in order to do uh, its mandate. So um, I'm not sure if DA, because a DA naman, they have the BSWM uh, has a mandate yes. also providing uh, ano, yung, uh, small irrigation systems uh, sa, ano, sa, in that uh, scheme of things. But our uh, governance in, in the, the book, we also uh, advocated for a SANA, a unified irrigation development plan, such that yung NIA, yung DA, um, and um, there's another the LGU, so the ILG will be part of this. Because by AFMA naman, the LGU are supposed also to uh, shepherd the CIS. So kumbaga, noong unang panahon, NIA lang talaga, yung mayroong uh, mandate for irrigation. But as time goes by, uh, na, uh, uh, the, some agencies are added uh, dito sa mandates na ito. So, uh, yun, I, I am not sure what, where is the optimal location of NIA 
but as long as the support system uh, and the other uh, collabor collaborating agencies uh, will actually be effective, uh, I think I don't uh, see a need for that to be really taken out of the office of the president. On the second issue of LTUs, tama yung sinasabi kanina na ang daming daming priorities ng, ng LGU and uh, basically the LGU also does not have the expertise, LGU may not have uh, the funds to really also manage education systems. So I wonder, well, well but it is uh, a, a mandate as per the AFMA, uh, pero titignan mo implementation, I think, uh, we, sh we found that of all the LGUs in the country, isang LGU, LGU lang ang merong successful management ng CIS. So we really need to understand, I mean, I mean maybe correct some of the policies that we have at this time, again, to have that optimal condition for our education development. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Rolla. I can see uh, Mr. Yu on the screen, sir. Would you like to say something? On behalf of Mia? Mr. Yu? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, sir. I, Go ahead. I'd just like to inform the group that Nia right now is under the office of the Cabinet Secretary. Okay. If you will remember, during the last part of the Aquino administration, Nia together with the PCA, NFA and the Fertilizer Pesticide Authority were taken out of the Department of Agriculture and put under the office of the Presidential Assistance for uh, under Senate, then Senator Kiko Pangilinan, uh, PAPSAM, o PAPSAM, Office of the Presidential Assistant for uh, Agricultural Modernization something. But when the uh, Duterte administration uh, took over uh, the three agency PCA, NFA, and FPA were returned back to the A and NIA was left with the cab office of the cabinet secretary. So until now, our agency is under the office of CAPSEC Nograles and uh, he is the chairman of the board of NIA uh, at present. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, um, ma'am, go ahead, uh, Senator Villar. Because uh, I am chairman of the Committee on Agriculture, Food, and uh, Rural Development, but I'm also the chairman, uh, the vice chairman for budget of uh, this agency. So I know their budget. So, uh, yung atim pung uh, budget for small irrigation facilities, they have it in the rice resiliency budget, the rice program of the Department of Agriculture. The rice program of the Department of Agriculture has a 15 billion budget. And one of their programs would be the small scale irrigation system, in addition to the budget of NIA. Okay, that's it. I just want to clarify. Yes, thank you, ma'am. It's much appreciated, Bob. Um, we have run out of time for uh, more questions. Uh, we're supposed to end by uh, 4.30. And in as much as we would like to um, entertain more questions, um, it, is an, it is not feasible to do so. Some of the questions that were left in the, in the chat box uh, mainly refer to particular pages in the book. So we will uh, send these questions to the author so they, they can contact you for their answers. So at this point, um, friends, please join me in thanking our presenters. Um, the authors of the book, uh, Dr. Briones, of course, our um, discussions, um, uh, Dr. Zhang and uh, Mr. Um, Montimayor, and um, of course, Senator Villar was uh, um, gamely answered also all the questions. Thank you very much, ma'am. But we'll see more of her um, very soon uh, for the um, posting. 
So, friends, uh, of course, Dr. Leo Sebastian for his intuitive and informative um, uh, presentation and for uh, delivering the message of uh, uh, of Secretary Dar. So, friends, uh, let's give all of them a big virtual clap and also thank you to all those who participated in the Q&A. To cap our event, uh, we have invited another special guest, and in keeping with the theme of our launch, we will hear from someone who has worked tirelessly in the areas of rural development and food security. She chairs the Senate Committee on Agriculture and Food, as well as the Senate Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. She has also worked for the establishment of more than 2,000 farm schools all over the country accredited by TESTA. She founded and shared the Villar Social Institute for Poverty, Alleviation, and Governance, or Villar CPAD, and its programs include assisting OFWs, sponsoring the yearly OFW Family Summit, promoting environmental protection, and creating various livelihood projects all over the country um, in over uh, 3,000 locations. Our closing speaker has a degree in Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from the University of the Philippines, which recognized her as the 2017 UP Alumni Association Most Distinguished Alumna. She completed her master's degree in Business Administration in New York University. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Cynthia Aguilar Villar. Ma'am? Thank you very much to the Philippine Institute for Development Studies for inviting me to be part of the virtual launch of their new book, Revitalizing Philippine Irrigation, a Systems and Governance Assessment for the 21st Century. Congratulations to all the people behind the book, the authors, writers, researchers, editors, resource persons, and of course, PIDS. You all affirm, reaffirm the valuable role of PIDS in producing relevant and comprehensive data and research. For sure, this exhaustive book is a must read for people such as legislators like me, as it can help us in crafting laws and policy reforms. Thank you for making our legislative work easier. It is really a very useful reference on the topic. All bases are covered, so to speak, as far as irrigation is concerned. This is the kind of research that we need. Research that is reliable and accurate for which PIDS is known for. Research that can influence the implementation of policy reforms, the process of lawmaking, and most of all, bring about life-altering changes to the lives of the beneficiaries of the laws and reforms. In this case, the farmers and their families. That is the bottom line for all of us if our work made a difference in the lives of people. PIDS analysis will be helpful in improving the country's irrigation development program for the maximum benefit of our farmers and towards a thriving agriculture sector. As an agricultural country, the sector is truly essential in economic growth as well as poverty reduction. Yes, ma'am. Very okay. well. I also would like to point out that I'm particularly pleased that it also covers governance issues and recent policy shifts such as the Free Irrigation Service Act or Republic Act number 10969, which I authored and sponsored in the Senate. It is considered as a landmark legislation, but as PIDS President Celia Reyes pointed out in the foreword, that RA10969 is not a panacea for all the ills beseeching the Philippine irrigation system. I will read with great interest your insights and recommendations about that. My Senate committee has oversight functions and we can look into issues and concerns about the law and its implementation. I also believe that the present irrigation program, which are big capital expenditure and recurrent operational costs to government should be evaluated in terms of the way it has improved the lives of the farmers' beneficiaries. And if it was able to solve our country's longstanding problem of food security, rural development, or was there a visible economic return over the long term? The bull also talked about the GIS technology 
which can help improve the way irrigation systems are operated and managed. I support that modernization and mechanization are truly crucial in agriculture. I echo the emphasis on the book regarding the importance of making prompt decisions on irrigation projects. Since implementation also often take time, consequently, the parameters used may no longer be applicable during the actual construction due to various factors. Time is always crucial. The book is also timely as the Philippine Development Plan mandates the preparation of an irrigation master plan to set the direction for irrigation development and framework for capital and its operation and management financing. The plan will make new estimates of irrigable areas and calibrate the targets for irrigation. I echo the sentiments of the book, so to speak, that while irrigation in the country has evolved significantly, from pre-colonial times and the present administration is prioritizing its development, there is still much that needs to be done and accomplished. As the current chairperson of the Agriculture Committee in the Senate, I'm committed to do what else I can do in the legislative front to initiate or institute reforms and remedies. I just want to... Uh, tell you also the PIDS that when I wrote that price tarification law, the basis is your study about the competitiveness of rice against uh, Vietnam, uh, because we know that the best producer of rice in ASEAN is Vietnam. And that was my guide, your costings in uh, uh, writing the rice tarification law and the Rice Competitiveness Enhancement Fund. That's why I put a lot of money to mechanization because the biggest price difference, uh, the cost difference is uh, labor. And the next is seeds. And the last one is irrigation. I know that irrigation is just the third, uh, uh, third in line in terms of cost consequences for the rice farmer. I think you're right that uh, they are big irrigation facilities is more helping uh, our power sector, our uh, water sector, not necessarily the rice sector or the agriculture sector. But uh, when you talk of uh, return on investment, you will think of those other things also. So your comprehensive assessment of the situation is, as contained in the book is truly valuable and very good starting point for policy reforms or legislative amendments. I'm looking forward to discussing this with PIDS, especially after I have finished reading the book. I hope you will give me a copy of the book. Let's work together to build a better, more resilient, more responsive and sustainable management of our water resources. Thank you, PIDS, for being a partner in the delivery of high quality, accessible, very well researched and relevant insights and information. Congratulations, more power, God bless and stay safe. Raming salamat po. God bless and stay safe too, ma'am. Uh, Senator Junior, we are very honored to have you on our event, and we are very happy to know that you find uh, the studies of PIDS useful. Maraming salamat po. Friends, before we finally close, uh, I would like to announce the two winners who will receive a printed copy of the irrigation book, and they are uh, Lucy May Labawan and Gaspar Valdez. I repeat, Lucy May Labawan and Gaspar Valdez. The webinar team of PIDS will contact you for your um, um, delivery address and uh, expect a copy of the book once it is off the press. And finally, we have uh, some reminders. Okay. Yes, our uh, PowerPoint slide is now showing. Okay. So, um, flash on the screen is uh, the URL or the link to the uh, e-copy of the book. So, for now, um, well, you can have it, you can, can download it anytime. It's uh, from the PIDS website and you can also uh, get, your, get a copy of all the presentations from the seminar page of the PIDS website. Okay, and um, please uh, help us improve our webinars by answering our survey, which will uh, uh, pop on your screen after the event. We will also send you the link 
in your email. Next slide, please. Okay, and also um, do visit our website and follow us on our social media pages. Again, thank you very much to our social media viewers, those uh, on Facebook and those who uh, follow the, um, the uh, live tweets uh, of the highlights of this event. And uh, for um, February, we would like to inform you of our webinars. In February, we have on February 11, um, PIDS will present its uh, latest assessments of the impact of the Pantawid Pamilyan Filipino Program, or the Four Ps. And on February 24, uh, we'll have a webinar on uh, the Institute's labor market analysis of SNP human resource needs in the Philippines. And finally, we would like to um, thank um, everyone. We'd like to thank the representatives from various organizations, from the government, academic, civil society, business, international development community, and media who join us today. We will, um, this slides will uh, remain on the screen after, even after the event, so you can see the names of those offices. So friends, we hope that you have learned something valuable from our webinar this afternoon. From the book launch, we hope that you will uh, get yourself um, a copy of the book. For now, the e-copy, uh, and later on, once we have, um, uh, once the, uh, e uh, the printed copy of the book is um, off the press, we will announce it on our social media page. So we look forward to seeing you in our webinars in, in February. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all the presenters, to all the authors, our discussants, and our um, guest speakers. Maraming salamat po. Bye-bye.